What is span? Here's the definition. The span of a set of vectors v in Rm, denoted by span v, is the set of all linear combinations of vectors in v. So note that this definition also applies if Rm is replaced by any vector space. And note that if v is equal to v1 down to vn, it's a finite set of vectors in Rm, or any vector space, we can write span as the set of all c1 times v1 plus c2 times v2 all the way down to cn times vn, where c1 down to cn range over all scalars, that is all real numbers. That's just explicitly writing down what is meant by linear combination. So note, the following terminology for span is used interchangeably. We can say span v, equivalently the span of v, the set spanned by v, or subspace, we'll eventually call it subspace, and the set generated by v, or subspace. So again, these can all be used interchangeably. Question, how many vectors are in the span of v1 down to vn? And the answer is, there's infinitely many. Unless it turns out you have the particularly simple case that all the v's are equal to zero, all the vectors are equal to zero. So try this. Assuming that all the vectors are equal to zero, v1 down to vn, describe all the vectors in the span of v1 down to vn. Put this on pause and we'll check answers together. Let's check your solution. So assuming that v1 down to vn are all equal to zero, then we can conclude that if you form a linear combination c1 times v1 plus c2 times v2 plus the scalar product of cn times vn, that's just going to equal c1 times 0 plus c2 times 0 all the way down to cn times 0. But each of these terms is just equal to 0 because it Scalar times a zero vector is always equal to zero, so the entire sum is equal to zero. And that's for all choices of scalars. So that means that the only vector in the span of u1 down to vn is the zero vector. So the span consists of only one vector, the zero vector. Particularly simple in this case. But how do we understand span when it's not so simple, in other words, when it's an infinite set? And the answer is that we use geometric visualization to do this. So let's look at visualizing the span of one non-zero vector. Here's a vector. We'll call it V. And note that the span of V is all vectors of the form c times v, where c is a scalar. So for example, this vector here is in the span, that's just one half v. And this vector is also in the span, this is negative v. And in fact, any scalar multiple of v is just going to lie along the same line provided that all the tails are pinned to the same point. So therefore, the span is the entire line containing v. Note that I should have written all cv, such as c is any scalar. Let's visualize a span of two non-zero vectors. So case one, we'll look at two vectors pointing in the same or opposite direction. Here's one vector, let's call it v1. Here's another, 
pointing in the same direction. We'll call it V2. So the span of V1 and V2, again, is simply all linear combinations of V1 and V2, which means all vectors of the form C1 times V1 plus C2 times V2, where C1 and C2 range over all scalars. So what kind of vectors do we get from this? You get, for example, this vector, which is this V1 minus V2. Here's another vector. This is just negative V2. And any vector you obtain this way will be on the line containing V1 and V2. So the span is just simply this line containing both vectors. Let's move on to case two. This is two vectors pointing in different directions. So what is their span? Recall that span V1, V2, again, is just all vectors of the form C1 times V1 plus C2 times V2, where the C1 and C2 range over all scalars. So here's one vector. Let's call it V1. Here's another. Call it V2. Let's draw V1 plus V2. By the parallelogram rule, we simply draw an arrow from the tails of the vectors to the opposite side of the parallelogram. And that'll be our vector V1 plus V2. That's in the span. But we can also look at 2 times V1 plus V2. So we go out in the direction of V1, 2 units, and 1 unit up in the direction of V2. And we end up with this vector, 2V1 plus V2. We can also go in the opposite direction of V1, 2 units, and 1 unit in the direction of V2. And that gives us the vector negative 2 times V1 plus V2. We can easily visualize other linear combinations of V1 and V2 by first drawing a grid like this and drawing arrows from the origin to any of the grid points, that is any of the intersection of the grid lines. This is negative 2V1 minus V2. So try this. On the grid below, draw the vectors negative v1 plus 2v2 and 2v1 minus 2v2. In part two, I'm going to draw a couple of vectors on this grid. Here's the first vector. Let's call it u. Here's the second vector. Let's call it w. So write u as a linear combination of v1 and v2, and also write w as a linear combination of v1 and v2. Put this on pause, and we'll check answers together. Here are the solutions. First, we're going to draw in the vector negative v1 plus 2v2. That means go in the opposite direction of v1, one unit, and two units in the direction of v2. And that gets us this vector negative v1 plus 2v2. Next, we're going to draw in the vector 2v1 minus 2v2, which means goes two units in the v1 direction, and two units in the opposite of the v2 direction. That's this vector, 2v1 minus 2v2. So for the second part, u equals v1 minus 2 v2 because we want one unit in the v1 direction and two units in the opposite of v2. And w is just equal to negative 2 v1 minus v2. So we can conclude that every grid point is in span v1 v2. That is, every point in the intersection of the grid lines is in the span.
But it's natural to ask, does span include any other points? That is, say, points that are not grid points, points that are not in the intersection of the grid lines, but are in the plane. And the answer is, it most certainly does. So here's our grid. And let's take a look at some linear combinations of v1 and v2 that don't have integer coefficients. For example, I did my best to draw the vector 1 half v1, that is going 1 half unit in the v1 direction, plus 3 halves v2, the tip of this vector falls between grid lines. Here's another example not quite on a grid line. This is negative 1.8 v1 minus 1 half v2. And here's yet another one. We draw a vector, say, ending up here. Again, not on a grid point and not on a grid line. This is 1 third v1 minus 1.8 v2. In a similar manner, we can reach any point in the plane by using the appropriate linear combination of v1 and v2. So we conclude the span of v1 and v2 consists of all points in the plane containing v1 and v2. Here's a simpler drawing of this case. By writing down a vector v1, vector v2, and just drawing the outline of a plane around it. So this would be the span of v1 and v2. Now I emphasize this is the case when v1 and v2 point in different directions. So let's visualize a span of three non-zero vectors. Case one, all three point in the same or opposite direction. And this is going to be very similar to what we saw before. The span is simply going to be the line containing these three vectors. Case two, at least two point in different directions, but all three lie in the same plane, like this, in which case the span is simply the plane that contains all three vectors. Again, similar to what we saw above. Case three. All three vectors point in different directions and do not lie in the same plane. Here's a visualization of the plane containing V1 and V2. V3 points out of this plane, and so the span is going to consist of all vectors in the plane translated up and down in the V3 direction by as much as we want, and therefore it's going to fill up this entire space that contains the three vectors. So the span is the entire 3D space containing all three vectors. If V1, V2, and V3 are vectors in R3, then the span will in fact fill out the entire vector space. Visualizing spans at higher dimensions is perhaps more difficult, but these one, two, and three dimensional examples give us a lot of geometric insight into span. So why is span important? Here's a preview of the significance of span. First of all, span gives us a way to visualize when the vector equation x1, v1, x2, v2 down to xn, vn equals b has a solution. In particular, if you look at the span of v1 down to vn, and if b is in that span, then a solution exists. That is, you can solve the equation. Let's take a look at a situation again with the span of v1 down to vn, but in this case b is not in the span. The solution does not exist in this case. So again a way of visualizing when you can solve this equation. Two, many sets of vectors that arise naturally in linear algebra are infinite sets, but they are the form span of a set of vectors v1 down to vn. These are called subspaces. Later, we'll find out that subspaces 
play a central role in linear algebra.